So our next speaker is Tom Johnson, who's speaking from the Bay Area today. Um, and Tom's going to be talking about overcoming challenges uh, in using Jekyll for documentation projects. Uh, so over to you, Tom. Thanks. My name is Tom Johnson. And uh, I, I'm a technical writer currently working at Amazon. I just started there a little while ago. Uh, previously, I worked at a company called Experian, which is where uh, we implemented Jekyll for some of our technical documentation projects. And that's where I'm going to draw, draw upon for a lot of these experiences. Um, and let me make sure I'm sharing my screen here. Uh, you can get my slides at idratherbewriting.com. It's just this latest uh, post there. And I also put them on the Twitter. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Uh, hopefully you can, oh man. Uh, yeah, OK, there we go. <laughs> uh, something's awry, just let me know. Before I get into um, these challenges in using Jekyll, I want to talk a little bit about why we started to use Jekyll. As one of the earlier presenters mentioned, uh, technical writers tend to have their own little tool set world. Uh, they use tools like Madcap Flare, Adobe RoboHelp. They use um, tools like Oxygen XML with Dita. They really don't use web-based tools like a lot of the UX designers and and developers do when they're they're building websites. So to to make this transition to Jekyll uh, really requires somewhat of a shift, right? You've got to you've got to decide that something is wrong, or something is too limiting with the existing tech writer tools, and uh, make this decision to embrace a new tool set with a new paradigm. So here are a few of the things that that I was feeling discontent for with tech writer tools. Um, Working in developer documentation, I found it essential to use a Mac. Uh, things just worked better, right? But almost none of the help authoring tools, which are usually abbreviated as HATS, um, work on the Mac. More expensive component content management systems, um, and I'm not talking about WordPress or Drupal, but uh, things like Arbortex or Ixiosoft can cost thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, Dita, this is an information typing pattern, uh, a specific XML structure that a lot of tech writers use. Um, it's very restrictive. You can't do a whole lot. So it's, it's easy to get frustrated in trying to innovate. Um, some of the other solutions, like Confluence's Wiki, uh, force you into this WYSIWYG interface, and you can't really get at the actual uh, text code uh, of what you're trying to write. Um, other solutions like WordPress just are too cumbersome with their infrastructure. You have to get Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP all running. And usually um, when you're working at a, at a company, you don't have this easy, easy way to deploy all this, right? You, you, it's a lot harder to get it set up, to get it working right. Um, and a lot of times enterprises forbid PHP. They don't, they don't want you to even use that stuff. Um, and further, a lot of the technical writers have to produce lots of different outputs for different audiences, and the whole mindset of, of WordPress and Drupal is, is one website, not ten different websites. Um, in general, the tech writer world tends to be too, too distanced from engineering. Um, uh, when you're trying to write developer documentation, it makes sense to try to get into the mindset of how engineers think and their their workflow and their environment and so it's helpful to use their same tool set and, and how they interact and finally all the good stuff with innovation and, and, and other kinds of advancements seem to be happening with happening with a lot of web technologies and the tech pubs tool set just lags behind um, things are very slow to kind of trickle into the traditional tech writer tools so with that sort of background, uh, th this initial post by Tom Preston Werner, the co-founder of GitHub and person who started this Jekyll uh, movement, um, really kind of struck a, struck a chord with me. In, in the seminal post, Blogging Like a Hacker, he says, on Sunday, October 19th, I sat down in my San Francisco apartment with a glass of apple cider and a clear mind. After a period 
of reflection, I had an idea. While I'm not specifically trained as an author of prose, I am trained as an author of code. What would happen if I approached blogging from a software development perspective? What would that look like? Now he was he was in a scenario where he was doing a lot of writing blogs. Um, but I'd like to turn that question to tech writing. What would happen if we approached technical writing from a software development perspective? And especially if you're working with developer docs with engineers and not necessarily end user documentation, this question makes a lot of sense. You know, you constantly work with engineers who are committing things into repositories, using their IDEs, they're working in code, you know, if you want to align yourself with engineering, uh, it makes sense to try to adopt their tools, and especially if you're collaborating. If you're not just the, the sole author, but you're somebody who is um, working with engineers who are also contributing content, well, they're going to be much more likely to contribute content if you use their tool set. So what does writing tech docs like a hacker look like? Your file format is text files. You author in a text editor, one of the many available. Could be Sublime Text, could be WebStorm, could be even IntelliJ. Um, for the advanced logic that, that so many tech writers want, you can leverage Liquid. Uh, you collaborate through version control with something like Git, and you version things that way as well. And then, of course, you build and pull it all together with Jekyll. So this, this talk is my, my journey into trying to use Jekyll for technical writing. You know, I've just given you the high-level overview, right, the idea. Um, there was a lot of details to try to work out. Uh, and I'm going to go through each of these details and share how, how I tried to solve them. Uh, I'm not a developer. I'm not a UX designer. I'm a technical writer, right? So I'm sort of uh, working within with certain limitations, I guess, uh, and trying to, to find solutions using Jekyll. And so the, the challenges I'm going to highlight are, are challenges that are pretty much specific to uh, tech comm sort of scenarios. All right, so the first challenge, designing the site. Uh, if you, you browse a lot of themes out there, almost all the Jekyll themes seem to cater to blogging scenarios. Um, and so I, I had to kind of figure out how to just theme a basic site uh, with some components that I wanted and branded in a way that I, that I wanted. Um, and I found that Bootstrap was really, really helpful. Um, and theming in general in Jekyll was incredibly easy. I used to, to create WordPress themes as a kind of side job. Uh, people would, would really want to clone their existing website and convert it into a WordPress site. And, you know, if you've created a Jekyll theme before, it's really, really quite simple. Um, but, but for all those other components, uh, beyond just cloning an existing site like your company site, for all those other components, Bootstrap is an amazingly helpful framework. You know, if you're not a UX designer, these, this uh, library contains many pre-built components that you just drop into your site once you reference the, the style library. Um, <clears throat> One of the big questions and one of the big reasons people who are in tech comm tend to resist solutions like Jekyll is because they have this belief that they have more advanced logic that they have to apply to their content. They, they want to apply conditional filtering. So they'll have one source file and maybe half of it applies to one audience and the other half applies to another audience and they want to single source the content. So they want to have just one source, but they want to push different parts of it out to different audiences. And I've heard from so many different people when I talk to them about Jekyll, they all say, you know what, Markdown is just too limiting. I, I don't know how I could do it. I don't know, don't know how I could single source my content uh, just using Markdown. It's way too primitive. Um, and so most people don't understand that Liquid is this tremendously um, powerful scripting language that you can use in your content to do very simple and even more advanced logic than you could with something like Dita. Uh, this just shows a very simple example of if you've got um, administrators, you, you put in an if and else if statement and you can render different content for different audiences. It's that simple. And, and I think that um, 
you know, I've used Dita before, which is this uh, you know XML architecture that has like conditional profiling and or conditional filtering and and uh, reuse on on steroids. Um, I think you can do more with Liquid in some ways. You can really cover any kind of advanced scenario that you have. Another challenge is multiple outputs. It seemed like most of the Jekyll sites that I was working with were really designed to be a single site. Um, and this is sort of a, uh, an add-on to the previous challenge, right? If you're going to single source the content, it means you have different outputs for different audiences. So how do you go from a single source, a single Jekyll project, to pushing out five or ten sites, you know, for different platforms? Maybe you have uh, PHP versus uh, a .NET versus uh, a Java sort of language for your tech docs and you want to separate them out. You don't want to try to smush them all together in the same site. Or maybe you have an enterprise version and a free version or you've got version 1, version 2, version 3. Well, some people do put them all in one site. It puts a lot more pressure or makes you have to build more sophisticated navigation within the site. And a lot of times companies just want it separated out. They don't want people to get confused. Um, so having this, this way to just generate lots of different outputs from Jekyll uh, is, was kind of critical. And my solution for doing this was to simply create different configuration files for each variant. And in each sort of configuration file, I would list different properties like audience, equal uh, audience uh, administrators, audience novices or whatever. And and then reference uh, things like site.audience for each of those configuration files. And that way when I built the site it would automatically pull those variables from the configuration file um, without having to adjust anything else. So just having a different configuration file for each output uh, seemed to, to work well. Um, and by the way, I, I do have more details in a lot of these, uh, and I'll get to that later. So if you want, you know, the, the technical deep dive, you can jump in there. Another challenge is handling environment workflows, right? It seems like in, in most Jekyll sites, you, you build a site and you publish it at a specific domain. Uh, you configure your URL and your base URL in your in your underscore config file, and that's it. But, but uh, in the tech writing world and a lot of other worlds, you have a one uh, environment where you're going to review the content, another environment where you're going to test it. You have an external environment. You may have multiple external environments. Um, so you, I had the challenge where I have this one project, but I need it to work on f four or five different domains, different spaces. Um, and the way that uh, the sort of default Jekyll configuration has you enter a URL and base URL was really limiting um, because then it wouldn't work at, at other uh, structures, at other paths, right? It had to be, you had to really think that through that carefully to make that work. Uh, so my solution was to just use relative URLs, to strip away the permalinks, put all the markdown files in the root directory, um, and then just not even use URL and base URL properties. Um, and as long as everything is in the root directory, then all the references um, to the style sheets, the JavaScripts, and other assets just worked. Uh, you could view it on your local machine just by launching the index file. Uh, you didn't have to do the preview server, so if you wanted to send it to somebody or just whatever server place they wanted to put it, it was easy to, to move it. Of course, that introduces other challenges. If you've got all your files in the root directory, it ends up being a rather long directory, uh, but <clears throat> I found some other workarounds for that a little bit later that I'll jump into. Okay, next challenge was the multi-level navigation menu. In most of the Jekyll themes I explored, it seemed like this multi-level navigation menu was really missing. Of course, there are a lot of themes that have a menu, uh, but to have one that maybe has uh, expandable sections, like an accordion that drop down, the, when, you, when you go to the, the page, um, it highlights that menu. When you refresh the page, it remembers where you're at. Um, to have this whole thing working, I realized, was, was a lot of code. It wasn't just a simple list. Um, and, and then um, I actually had a conversation with some GitHub writers who 
told me that the, the, really the way to do the sidebar navigation was to put all the, the, the uh, files in YAML, or sorry, put all the, the data in YAML and then uh, use a for loop in your sidebar code to basically read that YAML file. And so that's what I ended up doing. Um, I put all the, the menu items in the YAML file, use the for loop to parse through that and apply the HTML for formatting. And then for the other components, like the expand and collapse, the cookie, the accordion kind of stuff, uh, I use this jQuery component called NavGoCo, and it seemed to work fine. Um, but uh, I, I think th this theme I ended up building, part of the reason it's, it has any popularity is, is in part because of this sidebar. Um, and I even took it a step further and put a lot of properties in the YAML file for the different audiences and versions and then conditionalize the for loop so that it would check to see if it was matching the right property. Uh, that way it could use the same um, YAML file for lots of different outputs. Another challenge is alerts, little notes, tips, cautions. You want these to be the same and you want these to be uh, uniform and easy. And so I, I used um, some bootstrap formatting um, just to get and some font awesome icons to easily get sort of the, this look that I wanted uh, but I found that it was very easy to mistype something to break something to not format it correctly and it wouldn't really the way, the way I built the theme it didn't let me know of the errors so I stumbled on a, a better way um, doing includes with parameters so for a note for example you'd create a note.html include in your in your includes folder and use the um, include.content as, as the parameter that would be passed in there. So when you use it, you use your include note and then content equals whatever and then it just gets uh, pushed into that content slot. So I know that's it's kind of basic how Jekyll works functionality but it seems to work really well um, especially, and this is the good part, if you omit uh, a quotation mark, let's say you forget the trailing quote, uh, you'll get an error when you try to build it. And that's actually a good thing because I don't want the site to build and, and not to know if something's broken. Uh, you know, if formatting's messed up or something isn't displaying, I want to know that. Uh, another challenge was avoiding broken links in general. Usually in tech docs you have lots of links pointing everywhere, right? Because users jump in at any point and you have to try to orient them to the information they want to know. And sure you can use just regular markdown links pointing to specific pages, but that doesn't scale well when you change the page title, change the page um, file name, then suddenly you have broken links and you have no way of knowing that you've suddenly broken things unless you do searches throughout your content. Um, actually, avoiding broken links is one of the, the main selling points of content management systems. People, people say that you, you're never going to have a broken link because you've got this CMS managing things. Well, my approach to, to this uh, link management was to actually have a for loop iterate through my, my table of contents, my sidebar menu, uh, and get all the link names and all the file names and store that data uh, in, a, in a YAML file, in my data file, in a data folder. And then when I wanted to access uh, one of those links, I would reference it with um, something like site.data.urls.myfile, the name of it, and then .link, and it would automatically insert the, the link path. The good thing about this is that if I change the name of the file uh, or the title of the file, um, it's going to all the links that use this same structure are automatically going to get that update. Um, so it's not perfect here because if you if you have an error in the syntax, it doesn't let you know. Um, it just you realize that there's something broken. Um, but it's better than than manually managing the links and. Uh, once you get the hang of it, it seems to it seems to work. Some other people told me that, that this was their approach on the Jekyll Talk forum that they had a YAML file that had the, the stored the titles on the links and it worked well. Another challenge was PDF output. 
it's kind of hard to even talk about PDF because it seems like such an outdated sort of format, but so many tech writers are constrained by project managers, business requirements, and other people who insist on PDF output. Um, for whatever reason, they have to have it, and, and this pretty much uh, rules out a lot of different doc solutions, so I knew I had to at least generate a PDF um, so that people could print it. You know, maybe you have a prospect who you don't want to give access to documentation, but you want to send them a, a file, that kind of scenario. Well, I ended up implementing something called Prince XML, which is, is not cheap, it's not free, it's like $500, but basically you feed it a bunch of links, so I'd iterate through my sidebar menu to get a, a big list of links. You feed it to Prince XML over the command line, and it spits out a PDF of everything. Uh, and it looks quite good, actually. Uh, and you can store this whole command in a shell script so you don't have to worry about all the different parameters Prince XML needs and so forth. Um, and it worked well. Uh, I still hate generating the PDF because now every time you want to update the site, you think, oh, do I need to also update the PDF? And you have to run that script. But at least allowed me to get past some of these uh, people who would naysay uh, the solution out of the PDF requirement. Another challenge was how to reuse content across projects. We started out with, you know, we had somewhat of a small team, several writers, but we started out with everybody having their own Jekyll project. And I quickly kind of realized that some of my team members, um, they were new to Jekyll, and when they ran into trouble, it sort of became a blocker. Um, and then we had the scenario where one project had certain content that needed to be included in other projects, but if every project was its own kind of island, there was no way to push that content into them that, that we could think of. So we decided one day that instead of having separate projects, we would just have one Jekyll project that every writer contributed to. Um, and that solved a host of issues. It, it made it so that the one person on the team who was more savvy with Jekyll could solve issues for everybody else. We could store content that we wanted to reuse in a common includes, or, or sorry, in a common directory, and then you could include content as needed from that directory. Um, uh, some other details. Once you have everything in one system, now you have to suddenly exclude the content that you don't want in there, right? Because when you build your Jekyll site, it's going to include all this content. So you have to list all the directories you don't want included um, in, in the output. And then, and then uh, in order to sort of uh, make it so that um, the subdirectories where a lot of the individual project topics were stored uh, didn't break the formatting, uh, I just redirected the index.html page to the appropriate project homepage in one of the subdirectories so that the, the CSS and JS links wouldn't break. It was kind of a hack, uh, but it worked for, for this scenario. Another challenge, of course, with this version control is that um, technical writers usually aren't that accustomed to working in version control. So we, we ended up, of course, with merge conflicts and realized that we had to figure out exactly how to handle this. And we couldn't just plug into GitHub because all our content was behind the firewall and we had to use uh, Mercurial instead of Git anyway because that's what the engineering infrastructure was. Um, so we basically learned the necessary commands, the Mercurial or Git commands. There's a huge world of them, but the ones you need are, are a handful. Um, and we coordinated more. We would you know, let each other know when we were editing the same page or, or working with the same content, looking at the commit logs. And overall, um, it, it worked out well and it actually brought our team a lot closer together and, and really helped out uh, in terms of team cohesion. Now, um, I think I'm getting near my time here and I've got a number of other challenges, but this is probably one of the biggest challenges. Jekyll can be a complicated uh, solution. And it's non-standard. So when 
one writer leaves a company, if that writer is the person who set up everything and configured a bunch of complicated scripts and tools and custom plugins and all kinds of things, it can de debilitate the other team members who try to carry on after that person's gone. So I knew this and tried to emphasize simple, simple processes. Um, I avoided plugins because every time you update Jekyll, does the plugin work? Does it not? You know, and, and different people had different experiences with plugins. I wanted to stick with core Jekyll, um, and and also try to stop constantly changing processes and code. Right? You know, I was trying to figure out exactly the best way to work with it. So I'd often change things, and I found that other writers really didn't like this. They wanted to have uh, a known way of doing something, a uh, set way of doing it, and you lock it down. Right? Not just come up with a new iteration every month that tries to improve on things. All right, so there's some other challenges that I didn't quite get to here, and I'll just leave them. I'll just kind of fly by them because uh, I didn't really implement them. But search was a huge challenge, a robust search, not just a simple sort of JSON search. Um, another challenge was translation. Uh, never really got around to implementing a translation project, although we did do a pilot. Another challenge was authentication. You know, I learned that identity access management is a whole discipline unto itself. That I was just, you know, realizing that it was really hard to try to implement authentication for our docs. You know, I didn't want to authenticate in the first place, but uh, different requirements forced forced it. Uh, I I just want to conclude with this analogy of. Uh, the telegraph and the telephone. It's kind of a fascinating um, uh, historical lesson. Uh, and I think it's relevant to Jekyll because I think Jekyll is one of these disruptive innovations that's that's gaining more and more momentum um, as time goes on. So when the when Alexander Graham Bell first came out with the telephone, it didn't just like transform the world overnight. It, it kind of sucked. And the people who ran telegraph companies sort of laughed and chuckled at it and thought, oh, the telephone, you know, that's never going to become anything. You could, it was like two soup cans that you could hear static barely, you know, when they're 20 feet away. Well, the telephone kept getting better and better and better until eventually it was better than the telegraph. And when that happened, it pretty much put the telegraph companies out of business overnight. I think Jekyll's like that. It's it's one of these disruptive innovations that's getting better and better and better. And yeah, maybe right now there's not a ton of plugins and themes for tech docs, um, but it is moving upward in momentum. And I think at some point it will be like that telephone that just displaces the other technology. So if you want to see the, the doc theme I built, you can check it out at... Um, these links here in the slides. If you go to my site, I'd rather be writing.com. There's a Jekyll link in the on the primary nav bar, and it takes you to them. Have a couple of different versions, different sort of uh, uh, iterations, a newer and an older theme. But you're welcome to look at it. More than anything, though, it's sort of a um, a logbook about how I tried to overcome some of these challenges that I've been talking about, and you can see if uh, my my uh, way of doing it works for you or not, but at least it gives you some kind of comparison as you assess things. All right, that is all I have. I'll open it up for questions. Great session, Tom. Um, and on behalf of the Jekyll community, I just want to thank you for all the work you've done evangelizing uh, te technical documentation in, um, in Jekyll. Like, I know a lot of work has gone into that thing you've been building. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, um, I blog a lot, and so I write about what I'm using, experiences I'm having, and so it's just a natural byproduct of using Jekyll, right? Yeah. How can you how can you use it and not sort of talk about it if you blog? So. Yeah, and I think that's a common thing from today is people saying, okay, Jekyll's really great at hacker um, blogging for hackers. What else can we do with it? And I think that's questions we should be asking in the Jekyll community um, because it is a great tool for a huge number of things, um, but it just gets it just gets labeled as this hacker blogger um, tool. Are you done? Um, so my first question is, um, what do we need to what do we need in the ecosystem to make 
vehicle a better choice for technical documentation? So a lot of your talk was about um, problems that you've solved with themes. Um, what can we do in the ecosystem to make things better? Well, you know, right now I think Jekyll is still very much a developer's tool. And if you can make more documentation-friendly themes available uh, for tech writers so they can kind of plug into them without having to be a developer, I think that, that would be an advantage. Um, I definitely think a huge advantage of Jekyll is, is its flexibility, and you can make it do whatever you want. You can change it and make it fit whatever scenario, scenario you have. Um, but just giving people a starting point um, that that gives them a, a good doc theme with a strong search, good navigation, uh, ability to manage links. It's that starting point is essential. I spent so so much time just trying to get my theme and figure these things out. I think uh, most tech writers they, they don't really have that time, or maybe they're not like a tool tinkerer type. So you want to allow them to get up and running as fast as they can. Yeah. Um, and we've got time for one more question. Um, so can you just spend a wee bit of time talking about um, the technical uh, writing could have sort of process inside Amazon um, and the tool sets they're using and what mm -hmm. you have to see in the future? So, uh, you know, there's a lot of different tech writing groups at Amazon, and I'm, prob I, I'm probably not allowed to, like, disclose okay. what the processes are, but, I mean, there's different groups. There's, I think some people have used Ditta, others have used DocBook, others have different solutions, um, and uh, I'm still evolving our own group's tool chain and our workflow, so it's something I'm, I'm trying to uh, leverage, and definitely I, I want to use Jekyll for that, but it's still a solution that's like in process. I've only been there a couple of months, so it's, I can't really speak with a lot of experience there. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for spending your time here today. Um, All right. Yeah, I look forward to future updates on your thing. Thanks, Mike.